Well, I think um, Dr. Wilde must be the keenest speaker we've ever had here. Um, <laughs> setting off for the pulpit before um, uh, the allotted hour, but we're delighted to welcome you. And indeed, um, all of you this evening, I, I, I seem to recall that um, about a year and a bit ago, the Prime Minister was asked um, what Magna Carta meant. And he didn't know, which um, is rather surprising given where he was educated and the amount his parents spent on that education. But he didn't, it's pretty simple Latin. And anyway, everybody here will know because that's why you're here, which is terrific. So welcome to this Just Share lecture. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with our brand, we are a coalition of churches and development ag agencies specifically associated with the city and trying to keep issues of um, development and of uh, distribution of resources and of equality before the city. Um, and from, of course, a Christian perspective. And we hold regular debates, seminars, promoting um, justice. And indeed, uh, Wilf Wilde is one of the founders of Just Share, which is why it's an especial delight to have him here this evening. And he was part of that coalition long before I was even thought of, and before Just Share acquired its home in this particular place. Um, do please stay on afterwards, if you would. There are um, fair trade uh, refreshments available at the back for you. And I think you've all got a leaflet which explains um, the occasion. Just to introduce um, Dr. Wilf Wilde to you, he is, um, I should say, polymathic um, and uh, very distinguished in three or four very distinctive fields. Firstly, he is an academic um, with a DPhil from, um, from the National Institute of Development Studies at the University of Sussex. Secondly, he is a business practitioner with a varied career in the oil industry and latterly as marketing director at Ofgem. He is a dedicated Christian who since leaving the city has co-founded a Christian-led interfaith agency working on employment with black majority churches, migrants, to London and in Afghanistan. And he is an author as a theologian um, with two major interdisciplinary books on oil, geopol geopolitics, and biblical theology. He is currently the visiting fellow at St. John's College um, in Durham, which is both a mainstream Durham college, but also includes uh, an Anglican Theological College for the formation and training of new priests. And finally, he is a man of significant culture, and we're told that he is currently writing a novel with the provisional title of The Manchester Mercenary, set in the 13th century and culminating in the Battle of Lewis, the town in which he's lived for the last 30 years. Wilf, welcome to you. Thank you, George. I'd like to thank um, Tricia and George uh, for suggesting this talk. Um, it did come, as George mentioned, um, out of a chat with Tricia on uh, the novel, uh, which I'll refer to a number of times tonight. Um, this talk is too long, so apologies for that. I shall probably start going faster and faster at some point. If you do need to leave by seven o'clock, please do go. Um, it's about 50 minutes, so we should be all right. But if you need to leave in the questions, I won't be at all offended. Um, us academics are used to students walking out on us. Um, so please feel free to go. But also, I'm happy to stay for as long as you want to answer as many questions as you want, because this talk is, as ever with me, trying to pack far too much in to a limited space. And some of it thereby, I'm not explaining fully as I go speeding by. So, um, the Manchester mercenary. My anarchist son calls my mercenary time in oil in the city 
working in the belly of the beast. My first city jobs actually were in Gresham Street and Wood Street. So I'm moving this, I hope it's not spoiling the talk. About two minutes walk from here. And I moved south in that fateful Thatcherite year of 1979. And in the novel, moving to London in 1258 is a crucial part in the story of a young serf fleeing what was then a rural Manchester to find the town air that makes a man free, which is an old German medieval proverb. Now, after I finished in the city, I wrote two books, as George mentioned, on global capitalism to critique, really, our present inequalities of wealth and power. And I've been looking for a more political Christian theology to underpin that critique. And I actually see myself, that's why I love being in pulpits, as a missionary called to speak to my own people of a gospel of love, peace, and justice. Causes that in the last decade, in particular, in my opinion, since the Iraq war, we have been losing. And the origins of Just Share which, as George said, I've been in from almost the beginning, go back to this to create a response for the city, for capital, and also for justice. I chose to set the novel in the 13th century, in the generation, in fact, after the Magna Carta. I wrote it, I'm trying to write it, because I was frustrated that heavy analytical books on global capital are not easy for busy people to read. So I decided to write a novel. And as my daughter so helpfully put it, but dad, you don't read novels. My only answer is that I have read a lot of historical novels, particularly in the last year now, especially on the Middle Ages in Britain, so it was logical to start there. The novel, I'm gonna tell you the story, is about an oligarchic elite which does not speak the same language as the people they rule. They do not understand their issues, and by and large, they do not care. And if you're thinking what I hope you're thinking, this is meant to sound like Britain in 2015 as much as England in 1215. George Osborne-like, the rich, most of the rich billionaires that rule us do not care. Though, of course, they pretend to. So here is a modern political economist using history in his own laboratory of ethical judgment. King John of the Magna Carta or King Edward, Hammer of the Scots, are good case studies because it is clear that they did not care much about the common people. Do I use today's standards to judge the past? Well, more than most today, this elite espoused to live by the Christian faith. It's a standard by which they would have judged themselves. By past standards of their wars, the mass killing of millions of people in the 20th century, or in the dirty wars by drones on Yemen or Afghanistan, we can strip away here the so-called morals of our civilization. As Marx had it, when it comes to the colonies, we go naked. In King Edward's cruel rule in Scotland, you can still see why 21st century national anthems are bad memories of an old struggle. The struggle of oppressed and conquered peoples for justice and identity is a theme of the novel. And the key to the writing is to understand how we got to where we are now and to see what we can do about it from 2015. So I'm gonna start by focusing on Britain and the era of the Magna Carta in my novel, and then I'm gonna throw the talk wider to understand global popular struggles against empire. Just to stay with my more literary side for a minute, I will claim that my objectives are Brechtian. In other words, it's about ordinary people's experience of these class struggles. It is written from a bottom-up point of view so that it, and put in modern language so that it more easily translates to us. Most medieval novels and the history have to be rather top-down, 
what the elite did and thought, because that is what we have recorded. When it does go local and ordinary, the history tends to be social, how they lived, what they ate, what they made. My history is an attempt to be both political and polemical. My hero, in fact, the Manchester mercenary, makes a living in wool. In his era, the equivalent of oil and finance. Now, there are other popular British traditions. Robin Hood is reinvented in every era. And my Saxon hero is actually called Alfred of Ardwick, a great king's name, but he changes his name to Robin when he's on the run. My wife doesn't like the new name. He gave it himself, but I wanted to appeal directly to that tradition which later in its history started to add Prince John to its catalogue of often very violent tales. Interestingly, the early Robin tales were actually set in Edward I's reign, not Richard I, which was 100 years earlier. And my Robin is of and from everywhere and nowhere. His fight to make himself is a part of all our struggles. I will get on to Magna Carta in a minute. Now, you can't do medieval English history without being struck by the importance of 1066. King John was a descendant of William the Bastard. It gave us a ruling class who owned the land. Some of them own it still. If you want, check out the Duke of Westminster's rental income. Most of the Southern Saxon ruling class sold out to William quickly, far more easily than they had ever done to invading Vikings in the north. This meant that with William's coming to the throne, for nigh on 400 years, we had a ruling class that spoke a foreign language as their first tongue. The instinctive English antipathy to the French, I think, comes from that oppressed experience. It was not until Edward IV and the Wars of the Roses that the English king had English as his first language. And we were linked by the Normans to the European mainland, and the English people, therefore, were from the first linked into an empire. Under Henry II, John's dad, he ruled an empire from the Mediterranean to Scotland. And as a consequence, we fought the French a lot. The barons, in fact, were so desperate to get rid of John that they brought in a French prince in the forgotten invasion of 1216, and then it took two years to get rid of him again. But we kept on fighting the French all the way until 1815. The imperial propaganda, it's worth remembering, around such battles, Cressy and Agincourt, has always been a part of the English experience way before it brought us a very bad comeuppance after 1914. So I want to go back because Roman, Roman and then Norman rule before the Magna Carta brought us a tradition of rule by the military and the acceptable use of violence by the upper class on any that opposed them. Violent resistance was of course terrorism and therefore to be condemned as barbaric, Stone Age, and unchristian. It is important to critique this part of our imperial history theologically. For Jesus was crucified as a false king of the Jews, and along with two terrorists was given a slave's death on a cross. The Norman barons, like all imperialists, took on the Roman way with resistance. The British and Americans, I'm afraid, have our own bad histories which continue against this kind of resistance. Most of the places now labelled as failed states, Iraq, Libya, Somalia, Syria, Yemen, were bombed by the, IR, by, by the RAF for their resistance in the 1920s. And it was Churchill, when colonial secretary, who said it would spread awe and terror. His words, not mine. 
So if we look at resistance in the north of England after 1066 to William, his resulting, uh, uh, his resulting military invasion ravaged hundreds of square miles of the north, killing maybe up to 250,000 people, perhaps a quarter of the population of the area. The building of Durham Cathedral and Castle was an imperial statement. And I know, as a visiting fellow there, I love the place, it was my university, but you can still sense the imperial prince-bishop tradition, and not only via the tourist books. From Eton and Oyle to Durham and Canterbury, that's an old power path our, reach, our recent archbishop has just followed. My novel opens with the Norman tradition of what was called murdrum. This was a reprisal in killings or fines if any Norman lord was found dead. Lords killed at night happened quite a lot, so the Normans would retaliate. My story opens with Robin on the run for a death in his home village for just this reason. This tradition came down through the Nazis. You kill one of us, we kill 10 or 100 of you. And most sadly, it's the example of Israel today with the attacks in Gaza, for instance, last year. And the Saudis in Yemen follow in the same brutal tradition. The great biblical sin of Israel was that she had become just like all the other nations. And never was this more true than today. We need to recognize the realities of such powers and principalities if we wish to create a world of greater peace and justice. So I'm sure you may be wondering, what's this to do with the Magna Carta? What I'm trying to do is to set some contexts and apply them fresh for today for the world from 1066 to 1215. What happened after 1066 is that the Normans integrated England and then Scotland more slowly into what I insist on still calling feudalism, though it might have developed on its own under Saxon rule too. For all its violence and authoritarianism, feudalism was an expansive and productively growing system in Western Europe for most of its 700 years after Rome. New lands were brought under the plough, there were new production methods, and serfdom, which varied in extent alongside an independent peasantry, was more efficient than outright slavery. Trade developed from England to Flanders and down the Rhine to the wealthy Italian city-states. It was the city-states in the Middle Ages which Marx highlighted especially in England, were quite different from the old cities of antiquity. Under Rome and Greece, the cities were largely aristocratic, where the elite and landowners lived off their slaves, rents, and produce. Jesus rarely went into such Roman cities in Israel, and when he did enter Jerusalem the third time, they killed him. But London, even in 1215, was different. Understanding the rise and fall of feudalism and the kind of absolutist empires that survived in the East and in Russia until at least 1918, and you could say until 1989, is crucial for me to give the insights for the long trends of our own global capitalism, not feudalism. For by the 13th century of John, and especially by the 14th century under three King Edwards, the English feudal system was going into a long crisis. And John's reign marks the start of this in England. Now people know of the Black Death, which killed so many from the late 1340s. What is mentioned less are the famines and crisis of agricultural productivity, which date back earlier from the late 12th century. In my own novel, in the politics of 1258 to 64, were preceded by a famine in 1257, which meant the dead were left and buried all over the rural areas. What had happened in the previous 200 years 
had meant more population. No more land, however, for far more numbers. The serfs could not be driven any harder. England's population may be peaked in 1300 at 6 million, more than double that of 1066. And this population was not reached again until 1700. The cities, especially London, were already showing the trading dynamic that 200 years later was to lead to the fledgling merchant capitalism under Henry VIII and to the guild capitalism for the artisans, even more important by the time of the civil wars of the 1640s. London had its own charter, its own liberties, its own elected council, and even at times its own Saxon folk moot, which met at St Paul's, in which all the male citizens could speak and vote. Unlike Jerusalem or Tyre or Rome of old, I mention these because the biblical prophets all attacked those cities. In London, the cities in England were independent generators of wealth and growth, not parasites feeding off the poor in the rural areas. So from 1066 to 1890, he who held London held England. And William made sure he was accepted and crowned by the old nobility and his new conquistadors in Westminster. And when Stephen and Maud contested the throne in the 12th century, it was London's loyalty to Stephen which won him the day. In 1215, it was the baronial takeover of London which put John in such a strategically tricky position. So the Magna Carta deal was done at Runnymede, halfway between King John's defence lines in the castle at Windsor and the barons who were in control of London. Now the Robin Hood tales tell us that John was a nasty piece of work. The kings of England have usually been nasty pieces of work. Many would say that our politicians follow in the same high tradition. By picking on one, King John, and not more of them, the tradition of English kingship is thereby hallowed when it barely deserves it. In this, I follow the biblical prophet Samuel, who warned against kings. Now, besides his deceits and his fondness for other barons' women, Maid Marian would have really been under much more threat than from John than from the Sheriff of Nottingham. John's big problem was that he'd lost the French Empire by 1204. He was far poorer, so he was trying to raise taxes. And he also made a feudal call on the barons to fight to get the lands back. And in doing so, he pressed them too far. And seeing one of John's old favourites, a gentleman called William de Brosse, crushed, made them realise that they had little in law to prevent the same happening to them. If we follow the world's news carefully, we can see that violence is the ultimate sanction of the state. In just the same way, the government in the end supports the money system and banking. Given his economic and imperial problems, it is hardly surprising that John, under pressure, resorted to his inheritance of authoritarian rule and outright violence. Now, Shakespeare's King John is on this year at the Globe Theatre, and the trailer puts it really well. The remotest in time of all Shakespeare's English history plays, with its cynical allegiances and ruthless politicking now feels his most abrasively modern play. Written during a time of great political uncertainty in the Elizabethan court, King John explores in this election year, this is their trailer, how across the course of history, the power struggles of the ruling class have little changed. In Shakespeare's story, and it's true too, John was implicated in the murder of his rival and nephew, Arthur, a story that lies at the heart of John's tyranny in Shakespeare. The barons knew that they needed some protection in law 
against arbitrary arrest and imprisonment. Their main concern, of course, was their power, interests, lands, and thereby freedoms. But in concept, it set a tradition in motion that all the lawyers tell me, at least, are the foundations of our legal system today. Remember, this Magna Carta law only applied to the free, and at least 50% of the population were serfs. Going on to the dirty dealings of 1215, the Magna Carta was in effect the basis of a potential peace treaty. It would be better to call it a temporary truce because neither side kept their promises. John's death a year later was then followed by the acknowledgement of the Magna Carta by his son, Henry III, especially when he came out of minority rule in 1225. And this kept the barons quiet for a while. Between 1150 and 1250, more English cities were founded than in any other time in our history. So independent regional and local growth that the barons again had a base on which to assert their growing power. And they did so again 40 years later when my novel is set. John's problems, just to elaborate a bit further, had been caused by what today we would call a fiscal crisis of the state. He had no money because his more famous older brother, Richard I, the Lionheart, had spent it on his ransom and on his foreign wars. The wars were fought over the control of Central Europe, the Mediterranean, and the Middle East. Now that rhymes. Richard was the classic imperialist. It is remarkable for me that it's Richard's statue on his war horse that's one of the two outside of Parliament. It will be hard to find a king who spent less time in England. In fact, he only spent six months. As Eleanor of Aquitaine's son, France, where he died fighting, was always more of a priority than England, which was merely a cash cow. But the success of his imperial propaganda clearly weighed with the Victorians, who were, of course, similarly bent on a more global expansion of their own. And when Richard did come back, as in the Robin Hood stories, he only spent, stayed three months, and he spent most of his time capturing a vital strategic castle. You guessed it, Nottingham in which John's lackeys had taken refuge. That's the true history. The lackeys, like the sheriff, were all hung. John was forgiven. So, given all the sentiment on the last few days over the Magna Carta, I would like to sum up this end of the first half, first two-thirds of my talk, with a little quote. The Magna Carta is a redress of feudal grievances extorted from an unwilling king by a dis discontented ruling class. Now that sounds like a statement of Wilf the Revolutionary. Actually, it's a quote straight out of Winston Churchill in his history, The Sceptred Isle. And he's not a revolutionary. 1066 and all that is worth a read in this area, and they capture it beautifully. They describe two of the clauses of Magna Carta. No one was to be put to death, except the common people. Everyone should be free, except the common people. So for us, the common people, there are two linked, sometimes overstressed, further Magna Carta issues I'd like to now pick up. One is Parliament, and the second is taxation. They're obviously linked. Now, the Saxon kings sometimes had what was called a Wittenmut, a great council, which sometimes chose the king rather than rely on family inheritance. So Harold was chosen over William of Normandy. When the Normans took over kingly rule, this became more absolute. So one of the key barons' proposals in the Magna Carta was for a new council of 25 to advise the king including, of course, most of them, 
but that meant they were looking backwards to the old tradition as well as forwards. When Henry III was a child with regents, the barons had these powers, so in my novel, it's not until the 1240s and 1250s that the old problems of the king's advisers surfaced again. And when my fighters go to war, culminating in the battle in Lewis in 1264, it was actually in the name of something called the Provisions of Oxford of 1258, which were almost as important as the Magna Carta, but now forgotten by most other than the experts. The key to these provisions were to root out Henry III's family of largely foreign, French and Savoyard advisers and reinstate a new council of 25. So that was not really a parliament, but you could think of it as more like a shadow cabinet. Now 1066 and all that goes on to say, Magna Carta was therefore the chief cause of democracy. Well, it wasn't really. What it did do was that parliamentary democracy was brought out through a lot of later struggles, rather like that of 1264, by the common people. And it has to be said, with lots of violence, it should be remembered, so that these freedoms for the barons were extended to them. That freedom and power and accountability we are still struggling to get. My trilogy of novels, you see I'm getting over ambitious, will go on to show that if there was an English rising against imperial power in 1258 to 64, this was accompanied by one in Wales, which, won, which lasted on and off until Owen Glendower in the early 15th century. And then of course, there were the Scots Wars of Independence, led by a real Robin Hood called William Wallace. And most people, even in Wales, forget that, John, that Henry's son, Edward, conquered Wales in 1277 and 1282 before he started on Scotland in 1296. Identity issues in Britain go back a long way, as we have recently rediscovered in Scotland. From the barons, the people were learning to use the much later phrase of the wars of US independence that there should not be, quote, taxation without representation. As the US picked up this idea in the 18th century, they appealed back to the Magna Carta to give their uprising against Britain a historical tradition. But interestingly, George Washington, who was the biggest slave owner of the lot, kept slavery. So US capitalism needed another war the US Civil War, before it could establish itself in what the South still calls Yankee capitalism. But I'm going to go back to England. An uprising closer to a revolution, again centred on London, happened in 1381, and it's often called the Peasants' Revolt. But it was not. 1381 was an English rising as important in the towns as in the rural areas. And this one was more specifically against serfdom. It's, that's reasonably the only reason why the Peasants' Revolt title is justified. And it had less to do with parliaments. And the rising was also about the poll tax again, again to fund another war against the French. But since parliaments had been used since Edward I to maintain some sort of elite consensus, by the, eight, by the 17th century, the wider gentry and merchant classes of England were again to call on the Magna Carta as their rallying point against the divine right of monarchy. Now the biggest radicals of the Civil War, the diggers like Winstanley, who were busy founding their own churches and working out their own tradition of resistance, did not appeal as much to the Magna Carta. They blamed what they called the Norman yoke. To them and to me, it was the imperial imposition of elite power expressed via a corrupt monarchy that they hated and fought against. And although the other statue outside of Parliament is Cromwell's, and it may make it appear differently 
the victory of the English Revolution in Cromwell's era did not change representation in Parliament that much. Ironically, again a strange choice, Cromwell frequently closed Parliament in the 1650s in frustration because its limited franchise could not deliver what he wanted out of it. Nevertheless, after that revolution, the king could never rule or raise money without Parliament again. So, the English revolutions have come about when elite rule became so blatant and yet the elite were totally unable to see it. We haven't got there yet, but give us another 30 years of this and we might get there. A revolution was also made by elite incompetence and then by the upper class being split. Our own rulers have learnt this lesson well. Whatever you do, don't split the party. In questions, we could perhaps discuss more about the relationship between capitalism and parliamentary democracy, obviously an important global link since 1945. But it's perhaps worth saying that in ruling the void, the governing capitalist parties we now have, running the state in Britain, especially since the 1990s, have had a smaller and smaller mandate, with austerity used as an excuse for an ideological mission. We should go back to 1215 again and look theologically, for the Church of England's role in the Magna Carta was important. Archbishop Langton was the crucial mediator and perhaps the drafter of the Magna Carta, but he was actually seen by the king as being on the side of the barons. John had actually given ground to the Pope in even accepting Langton's appointment in the first place. And the English church was excommunicated for six years because of John's refusal to appoint Langton. It was probably Langton then who drafted the very first clause of the Magna Carta guaranteeing the church's freedom. Now, this is not quite the charter for religious freedom of expression, you might think. What it really meant was to stop the kings selling bishoprics, Richard had used this a lot to fund his crusades, or the alternative, as both John and Henry II had done, which was not to appoint to top church positions, where thereby the revenues came to the crown instead. So, this freedom charter was more about power politics and revenues than about theology, sadly. But the major issue for me about the Magna Carta Church was that it was largely representative of the ruling class. Bishops and archbishops in England, with few exceptions through most of its history, have been from the same ruling class of barons and capitalists that have ruled us, the common people, for a thousand years or like Woolsey or Thomas Cromwell, it was a ruling class ideology they bought into. This is the major reason for me, I'm going off tack here, but I'll say it anyway, why the church has lost the mass of the English people from the gospel, because the people heard not the voice of Jesus, but the voice of establishment. In my novel, the disdain for the medieval's church in my hero's own spirituality naturally reflects my own. In the struggles of the 13th century, the king knew he could always look to the Pope to support any attempts versus more democracy and accountability. In 1215, the Pope was so furious when he wanted King John's forces on his crusades he was furious because Langton would not excommunicate the rebel barons. If the Pope's rule came straight from God, so did the King's. So any attempt to upset this order, as King Charles realized, was a threat to the Pope, and therefore, on his definition, to the Catholic Church. And ironically, in England at least, on the long run, this proved to be a self-fulfilling prophecy. And like Cromwell, the northern barons against John claimed to be an army of God. <laughs>
I'm coming nearer to the end, you'll be pleased to know. What is worth noting for today, then, is that as feudalism became less and less effective internally, our kings fought more wars, conquering Wales, Scotland, and bits of Ireland to expand the land grab under a mode of production that was struggling. There are still consequences of this today. We can expect a struggling global capitalism to do much the same. Note, therefore, not only the wars of the Middle East and Afghanistan, but the new military dictatorships of Thailand, Honduras, Paraguay, and Egypt. See the attempt by the US to boost its own imperial hegemony with the sheer size of its military spend against the US's only own declining economic power. Worth notice as a warning that the US spends more on its military than all the other major powers, Russia, China, Britain, Germany, and France combined. At the end of Mark's gospel, there's a little chapter which is sometimes called the Little Apocalypse, chapter 13, that imperial wars are often accompanied by civil wars. How many more examples do we need after Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, Syria, the Ukraine, and Yemen? Sadly, I think our rulers do know what they have been doing. They have not made what they like to call a mistake. These civil wars are grounded on the old Roman rule, British imperial rule, and it's called divide and rule. In many cases, if not in all cases, the imperial powers have deliberately funded or fostered these civil wars, labeled them as revolutions, and spun them then as the fault of their own enemies. Today, for me, the English church, like the global church, has to join theologically and politically the resistance to this kind of Caesar in the name of Christ, or it is nothing. And to be fair, many have tried. And in our day, these Caesars, I should add, are known as Bush I and Bush II and Clinton I and very likely Clinton II, amongst others. And apart from the EU and migrants, did you notice the complete and utter absence of global issues in our last election campaign? Do I really care which Caesarian party won? The triumph of a capitalist imperialist militarism was never even questioned in the debates. And it is the issues that were not raised that matter globally. Three prime ministers have lied to us on Iraq, Afghanistan, and Libya. They have not told us much of the truth about Syria. And the leaders that have asked us to back them again have already, with no demur, lit the blue touch paper so that virtually the entire Middle East is at war. Who is to be made accountable? A spineless establishment allows our foreign policy to be run in effect by the US neocons. NATO supplies conventional weapons which are used to kill the people of Yemen, half of whom are starving. Saudi Arabia and Israel, two rogue states created and supported by us, have attacked other countries and killed civilians in breathless displays of military arrogance. And all this goes by with not a word by the audience or the speakers in those futile election debates. In parts of Africa, in Mexico, in Colombia, and in the US, we have low-grade security wars killing people in their thousands. At least they call it war. But like the, the Yemen, the wars on drugs and terror are largely wars on the poor fought for the very rich, with most of the world looking on. So I want to conclude my talk with a warning drawn from the Magna Carta. 
In today's neoliberal global economy, the imperial battlegrounds, the theaters of crisis, Clark calls them in his book on 1914, are substantially the same as a century ago. Africa, the Balkans, China, Iran, Iraq, the Middle East, Russia, Syria, the Ukraine. They were all fought over actually or implicitly in the imperial wars of 1914 to 1945. Since 2003, we've been slipping into a further decade of global military conflict. Perhaps only at the level of insurgencies and minor wars at present, not a great war, but they nevertheless set the tone and the parameters for the future of global capitalism in another imperial era. The Magna Carta was put in place to try to prevent the worst abuses of authoritarian, military, and violent state power, used internally and externally. Today, as capitalism struggles to expand globally, globally it is this same abuse of state and military power that has set dangerous precedents for all the peoples of the earth in the 21st century. Events after the Iraq war have been a disaster not only for Iraq, but for the planet's democracy and accountability. If we ever needed a resistance and a new charter for the peoples of the earth and against the abuses of power, we need it now. We need the gospel of Christ, of love and of justice, not the gospel of Caesar, of hate and war. Well, thank you very much for that um, astonishing romp through imagination and history from the Middle Ages and onwards for plenty of color for your own person and your own conviction there um, and for a, therefore a great deal of warmth and also for a lot of interpretation, much of it I sense quite contentious. Um, I think we've got 10 minutes or so when we, you're going to respond, you're happy to respond to some um, immediate questions and then we can have refreshments and people can um, talk to Wilf more informally. Um, Trisha's going to be, um, come among you with a microphone. Um, if you have a question, please place the microphone really quite close to your um, mouth to enable it to work effectively. Sir. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, can you hear me? A bit closer to your mouth. Sorry, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is Moin Yassin from Global Vision 2000. From an Islamic perspective, I fully agree with almost everything you've said. I didn't know what you were going to say, but I've heard it and I concur. I, I want to take your argument to its conclusion, uh, or perhaps a, a logical uh, deduction is given the absence, many people didn't vote in this country, as you know, uh, given the, the disaffection um, and, uh, dare I say, the lack of integrity which you've mentioned in the ruling class, broken down into the political parties, and also given the fact we've got cartels, including the oil one, by the way, banking oil media, um, I, I put it to yourself. Isn't there a case for an alternative either political party or movement uh, which promotes justice, equality, and truth, uh, 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 and specifically with no conflict of interests uh, inherent in it? Th thank you. Thank you. We, uh, another question as well at this juncture? Yes, madam. It's just coming... To you. Hello. Very, very quick question here. How would you, in your sort of broad analysis, contextual, contextualize the Arab Spring? I know you, you made 
um, several references to a cluster of countries. But how would you how would you broadly contextualise that, given that a lot of that would seem to have come from within and not from without? Thank you. So there's one about um, the shape of a political future and one about um, the contextualization of the Arab Spring. Um, a reflection, perhaps, rather than an answer to the uh, first question. Um, I was trying to think, when I finished in the city 20 years ago, kind of what my objective was. Um, and I, I don't think I would want to even pretend to try and create a new political party. <laughs> Though I, I would at least know what principles it might be. But I, the way I kind of set my stall out 20 years ago when I became freelance, as it were, was borrowing a phrase you'll see in my first book, one of my heroes, a guy called William Morris, who fortunately I didn't even mention in the talk. And he had three words for the task he set himself, which was educate, organize, agitate. And I'm thinking in my last 20 years that I think the weight I mean, I'd, and I specifically chose not to go into much detail on it tonight. For instance, the media coverage of the Ukrainian-Russian crisis, I think, has been worse than even the, courage, uh, the coverage of Iraq and Syria and the Yemen. Just dreadful in terms of not understanding or attempting to understand in a Cold War game the way that crisis has worked out. And thereby, I think, the ability at the moment to organize and to agitate is, is quite low, quite depressing, to create something from afresh. So can I borrow a phrase and twist it from Tony Blair, where I think we are now, which I think is educate, educate, educate. People are often just very ignorant, unfortunately, about, the, about our imperial history, and about the imperial games that are going on. And of course, people in Iraq, people in Syria, at the, at the getting hit end, understand that quite well. And we can talk about that in terms of Islamic movements. I think the problem for us in the imperial center, as I tried to say in my early talk, that imperial propaganda we've had for a thousand years, and to try and see through it, because it's not always completely wrong, it just needs the kind of contextualization that I've obviously done in a very sweeping way today. Uh, but it, it needs that constant education so that people are well informed about what's going on. And by and large, I find even my own kids, who are both PhDs now, both working in universities, both with their own political things to do, it's very hard to keep on top of the stories. And being freelance, I can follow what's going on in Yemen and Syria and Iraq and the Ukraine. It's actually very, very difficult for most people to do it, unless they have a personal connection. And the Arab Spring? And the Arab Spring? Well, I think I'm more cynical about that than perhaps uh, you are, uh, in the sense that, remember the phrase came from the Americans in the first place, came from the West. The idea was that now we've invaded Iraq to create democracy in Iraq, we could do with democracy in the rest of the Middle East. And of course, Egypt was the big test case. And actually, Mubarak did open up and have elections in 2005. I mean, of course, his own party won. I don't know how many of the votes they got, but it was, you know, like 95%. So, and that was then called the Arab Spring, and that's five years before the revolts broke out. I think Egypt is the key there, because it seems to me what we can now see more easily with hindsight, two years after the military coup, is that what actually went on, yes, was popular protest, yes, was real revolt in the streets, yes, was some real reasons for people being against Mubarak, but also, if you like, and I use that phrase of the elite being split and the elite also being incompetent, huge elements of that were present in Egypt. And I think the bottom line was that the general wanted rid of Mubarak, and they certainly didn't want his son coming in as president. So the popular movement and the movement from above, if you like, came together. And in fact, again, less publicized, what was going on in the Yemen was equally as violent in, as in Egypt. And there, actually, they managed to get their new man temporarily. They got rid of Saleh and they brought Hadi in. And now the conflict goes on internally as well as externally. So the generals wanted out, wanted Mubarak out. 
Then, of course, we got the only really organized democratic movement in Egypt in place, which was the Muslim Brotherhood, getting them in power. They decided they didn't really like that very much. And, of course, the Muslim Brotherhood still faced the huge economic and social divides that rent Egypt. And ruling on their own, they were sitting duck for the military to then take over. And so what have we got in Egypt? A military coup, a more repressive, a more, I mean, 40,000 people, I think, arrested. I don't know how many executed. I don't know how many killed on the streets. But I think Egypt has gone backwards. I, I, my, one of my best friends from Durham did his own research in Cairo amongst the revolters in the streets. And he's saying, I think we've lost Egypt for another generation. And I would only point to one other thing. In the oil price terms, I think the oil price is driven by political risk. Oil prices rose on the Egyptian, let's call it revolution for ease of reference. Oil prices doubled on the back of that revolution. They've halved since 2013. That says to me, the powers that be now think, and Egypt is the symbol, we've got the Middle East under control. Of course, it doesn't work for the peoples. It means poverty and famine and war. But as far as the imperial elite is concerned, for now, and why do you think the Iranians are being forced into a deal? For now, I think they think they've got it under control. Want one final question, sir? Are you, were you wanting that question? One final formal question, and then we'll break up for refreshments. Very close to your mouth, if you would. Uh, yes. Um, you didn't really, I think, develop some of the uh, feudal themes into, if you like, the current age. And they are, I think, very present, um, particularly in the UK, but perhaps elsewhere. But certainly very much, if you like, the area of all the royal prerogative powers, the way that government can rule without, if you like, being held to account. Um, and even when there, is, there are structures nominally of holding to account, they are pretty ineffectual, parliament being the best example. So really, in the struggle for power, it isn't sufficient to have an alternative part, political party to take control because it doesn't serve the interests of anyone in power to then lose power. So the answer surely cannot be more of the same just with different faces at the top. I mean, you know, the Labour movement tried it 100 or so years ago. Look where we are now. Yeah. I agree that the problem is in a country of just take Britain of 70 million people, how you get the kind of popular participative democracy that, as I said in London in 1215, you could go to the folk moot and there would be an open debate. Yes, it was only men and it was only citizens, so it had its limits. But now it, we could use that as a model, if you like, for the broader assembly and a little bit of the line I took out. And of course, that's what the ecclesia was in the old Greek cities. So the, the word that Jesus used for what he was trying to build, the ecclesia, did not necessarily have all the churchy connotations we have today. It was the popular assembly of citizens gathered together. Now, how we recreate that in the modern era, I think is, but I think you're right in saying, just about a new political party. It's, it's really about somehow in a much bigger sort of society. And I think it does come down to thinking, I mean, Scotland in one way is one expression of it, but I think it's about local, local democracy because for the last thousand years, democracy in Britain has been going the, the other way, always the other way, always to more centralization. And, and since the Thatcherite regime, power's taken away from local councils, so that local councils are a bit of a joke, really, as, of course, the Scottish saw about the Scottish New Labour politicians. They were placemen driven by London. A little phrase from William Morris, um, one of he was saying this, if, if parliaments ever changed anything, they would abolish it. <laughs> that, that's a very suitable moment on which to conclude. With thanks to you, Will, for your fluency, your humanity, your scholarship, your enthusiasm. Um, yes, you must be exhausted. You certainly <laughs> need a drink. And with thanks to all of you for coming. We're very grateful. <laughs>